All right. Okay, this is going to be a talk about interacting with the Internet of Things. Um, uh, obviously using Godot, so I left that out of the title. So a uh, schedule of what we're going to cover is what the Internet of Things is. I'm going to show a little demo with a scoring panel uh, that's been added to Dodge the Creeps demo game. Um, this is using a technology known as uh, MQTT, uh, which is a, a very lightweight publish and subscribe system that's quite widely adopted in industry and uh, household automation. Uh, how to receive messages back into Godot from the MQTT system. Node Red, which is a very useful um, application for like uh, reading these little messages and altering them a bit and then sending them out. It's a, it's a good management tool there. Um, and uh, also I'm going to show a little robot uh, demo and then have a little word about industrial graphics um, and where this go, where, what this means for engineering software. So uh, normally, let's see how's it going. Yeah. So normally if you look into the, uh, let's just double check. Yeah. Uh, if you if you look at the after the internet, uh, what the uh, internet things is, you'll get a uh, buzzword bingo card, which you can take along to your next sales meeting and tick off all the different um, words that they read off that don't mean very much, and usually you, they just tie the words together with lots of arrows and not much else. I particularly like even more complex diagrams, which just throw, try and show the whole stack of uh, equipment from sensors to whatever they call the cloud, which was computing that's sort of not on the computer, but on a server. And then they think that all computing should be done on this cloud. And so when it's not done on the cloud, we're going to have to come up with some other cloudy name called fog, you know, as opposed to just doing it back on the computer that's not the server. So. Um, my definition of Internet of, the, uh, Internet of Things devices is it's simply a thing that's connected to the Internet. So uh, it can be anything. So uh, just take an example of, of my uh, Quest 2 device. The controllers that connect to the Quest 2 by uh, Bluetooth are not things in, in the sense of this because they're basically just uh, peripherals on this device. Had they had little Wi-Fi uh, um, chips in them and connected to the Wi-Fi router and then back to the headset, then I'd call them things. But uh, if they just connect directly, they're not things. They're just parts of the same system. Um, and the thing about uh, uh, when you connect to the Internet, there's only one Internet. So uh, it's it's a definite threshold that you cross when you, when you use that mechanism for communication versus just some internal uh, system. And then obviously the Quest 2 is an IoT device uh, for, for all intents and purposes. And so, okay. Um, so the first sort of uh, way that IoT stuff got into the uh, mainstream uh, was uh, the Arduino, uh, which is a very popular microcontroller um, that was first made, uh, uh, I think it was available in about 2012 and uh, made these general purpose little little microprocessors programmable and easily hackable with little electronic circuits. And after a little while, you then had um, uh, Wi-Fi shields or Ethernet shields you could put onto it. And then now we're connected to the internet and you program it a little bit in C code in this fairly easy uh, IDE. And you now had legitimately an internet of things device. But um, nowadays uh, there are uh, much more capable and cheaper things than the Arduino, although the Arduino is the, the well-known device. Um, and uh, the, the, my favorite one is at the moment, this thing called the ESP8266, which retails at about $2, depending on where you get them. And they have, uh, you can see on the, on the lower one, it's got a little Wi-Fi antenna on it. So it's got full Wi-Fi as well as uh, uh, being very cheap and powerful enough to run uh, a programming language called MicroPython, which, is pretty good if you're tired of programming in C++ and would like to have a like a command line on your microcontroller. And the one above is an ESP32, which is got like four times the um, RAM as, as the lower one. So if you're doing development, you should always do it on the ESP32 so you don't waste time trying to optimize your thing because the 
8266 is, is, is a little small. However, uh, both of them, uh, in my view, they're much better platforms for this kind of game than uh, the Raspberry Pi, particularly when you're just making something that's like sensing a, a light bulb or a door sensor or something, and you don't need a full Linux stack to run it. You can do it on, uh, on, on this device and get the job done. So here we go. Here's the quick, quick go of the score. I'm not going to do it live because uh, it'll just go wrong. But if we uh, play uh, the scorecard, which is running on an A266 off a battery just to show it's, uh, it's actually disconnected from it. And along we go, we play the creeps and it starts publishing the score to it back and forth. And we run around a little bit and then eventually it's the game over. That scrolls on. And then uh, after I close down the window, we get a, uh, a disconnect message. It's kind of useful to know that we're, we're done that way. <clears throat> so what's happened here? Oops, there we go. What's happened here is <clears throat> the MQTT protocol um, has at the center of it uh, what's known as a broker, which is some process running on a server that you can access uh, usually from a URL. And client which sends things to it, known as publishing, and a subscriber which receives things uh, and, and receives any message that matches a template belonging to the topic. And you, you can run these uh, clients just from a command line if you download uh, the, the, the client onto your, onto your PC. So uh, if you look at the above one, you can you can print, uh, you can publish uh, to the host test.mosquito.org, which is a public uh, uh, MQTT broker. Not really recommended to use that one because it's rather overloaded, but it's a good way of stress testing the software. Um, and then the topic being, it's almost like a file name, something with slashes in between, and then message, sometimes known as the payload. Hello there. And over, uh, if you were to run the second uh, command at the same time, you would see the message show up because that template with the wildcard hash matches the topic and it'll print out the message. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the uh, the, the little uh, dot matrix thing is subscribing to that topic uh, creep slash message and whatever message comes through will scroll into it. So at the end, at the Q&A, you can see if you, uh, I'll see if anyone can actually publish any que uh, questions on that uh, ticker tape while I'm answering them. So uh, the code that I actually have running on the, um, yeah, on, on the little device is uh, this little bit of MicroPython. So um, like I say, it's, 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 a, it's just like GD script code and have that little scrolly effect uh, on, the, on the words as they come through. And that's, that's as easy as programming that. Um, if we then have a little look in the Godot code, the MQTT uh, module that we ported in from uh, MicroPython, all it is is like some bit and byte bashing into uh, some strings, which then get sent onto a, uh, a TCP connection through the port 1883 to the server and all that. Um, normally, you, you don't normally have to look at this code unless you're having to debug it. But uh, if we go back to our uh, our game, what, what's actually happening is we publish the string, score colon two, to the broker, and then my dot matrix is subscribing to that topic, and whatever comes through is then scrolled onto the screen. And um, yeah, there's this extra little uh, feature because the thing about the MQTT protocol is it's got almost everything you need to, to, to get your job done uh, without having to hack around lots of workarounds. So uh, one very nice feature is it has this last will function, which is a, a, a topic and payload, which is left in the broker until um, we disconnect from it. And when the client disconnects from it, then that message is released almost like a dead man's handle after death of this of this connection, a message, uh, one final message comes out. And this is kind of useful for uh, working out what, what's going on in the network. So if we go to the actual game code, uh, which you might be familiar with if you've done the, done the uh, tutorial, uh, all I've done is added in um, a uh, topic saying we're connected when, when in the ready command and a game over whenever the game over gets called. and. There's another function which has the uh, score 
just scroll, just going out from the same thing. There we go. And there's the uh, last will and testament, which is what comes out when the entire game shuts down. Now, I also uh, didn't, although I didn't video it, I, I put in a high score implementation as well, where uh, I subscribe to a topic known as high score. And whenever a function, uh, whenever a game play gets to a score higher than that, then I publish a new high score up to it. And this has a new, um, uh, let's see, this has a new uh, parameter. Uh, called retain. And so that's a message that is left on the broker when you publish it. And every time a new connection comes in asking for that topic, it releases that message on the connect. It's almost like your ready command. And so that also gives a, a, a nice way of leaving persistent messages such as high scores on the, on the server. So the high score implementation uh, simply uh, receives the high score in the ready command or subscribes to it. And when the uh, uh, when a message comes in on that subscription. So even while the game's playing and another another player scores a higher number than this, it'll go through the broker and then come back down to here as it comes in and copies into the known high score parameter. And then whenever we get a score greater than high score, we uh, publish it back up with the retain equals true flag set. So, all right, I was, I was going to mention uh, Node Red, where I've actually done a little bit of uh, messing around because I didn't want to recode my uh, dot matrix, to, uh, which, which has that special MAC address uh, for my own purposes, um, to have it subscribing to, to Godot slash creep slash message. So what I've done is I've actually um, in Node Red programmed it to receive signals on that and then publish it straight back out onto the one that the dot matrix is listening to. Now, this would be, uh, this is a hugely capable system, which you should all know if you're doing any uh, server-based stuff like this, because it means you don't need to lo log into the server. You can just edit it straight through a browser. And for a high score, for example, we could uh, reset the high score every morning back to zero, or, you know, or keep a little database who's winning and so forth. Um, and that's, really what you can do here. It's immensely powerful, this, this system. So finally, I've got a, uh, a little robot on wheels that I also ran. Uh, on the right is the Godot code, where I just sit there on an input event. And uh, as each key press goes in, I uh, produce a string of numbers, um, usually corresponding to the two wheels, forwards and backwards, and how many milliseconds. And then I publish it to topic wheels when uh, a, a message comes through uh, or one of the keystrokes happens. And on the left is the code sitting on my little robot device, which is receiving the, um, how is it? Yeah, it's receiving the message, splitting it into the individual uh, character, uh, individual words, passing them to int and then passing them straight to the motor controls. So, I mean, this is always important. You have to write both ends of an IoT thing is, is the thing has got to do something, particularly if you've made it, and then you've built an API for it. And so you then have to service the API from, from, from your other end. And, you know, that's part of the game. So here's where we play the uh, robot game. Oops. There we go. Let's start them up. Okay, so as I left and right keys, left, it spins around, forwards, oh, oh, it goes off the table. Uh, it did break quite badly, but luckily I could put it together. So, um, how are we doing? Right, so MQTT is widely used for monitoring, actuating, and home and industrial automation signals and plants. So, uh, wherever you've got a, say, pollution monitoring system or weather station, uh, quite often they will publish their readings of the environment or whatever they're reading um, to uh, an uh, MQTT broker, which many other things might uh, be subscribing to for their own purposes. So, uh, you know, one p pollution monitor might be picked up by the local town to, to, to make readings of it. And at the same time, the weather sir, uh, system in the country might be reading from the same broker and feeding it into its database for a different purpose. 
Um, you can also use it for controlling um, things like railway signals remotely. Uh, like once again, it's just tiny amounts of data that just needs to critically go and turn the flag up or down, red or green. And um, this is where there's a, a, a another little option in the protocol called the quality of service. Uh, you just have three levels of that. Zero being that uh, fire and forget. One, it'll make a kind of a, a good attempt to get the message through and quality of flag uh, two is it's going to keep trying and make sure the message gets through come what may. And if it doesn't, then you're going to get alerted to it. So you don't need to hack all kinds of extra protocol onto it. It's all built into the system uh, to get the, to get what you, what you need done. Although, you know, uh, you, there's nothing wrong with the uh, IoT device then sending a MQCC signal back telling its state. So now you've got like a second confirmation which you can work with. Okay, let's go. Uh, another place we've got MQTT running is in uh, lots of power plugs um, around the hack space. So this is a Sonoff, quite a cheap, good power plug. And we've flashed our own software into it called Asperna. And once again, you see that we're, we can configure it to uh, talk MQTT in and out and even set what the quality of service is, as I was mentioning. Um, Another place we've used MQTT is the uh, whenever you get some smart light systems, you've got, uh, in this case, it's a ESP8266 running strips of NeoPixel, and it's got a little web interface, but it also in the, under the config has an MQTT control system where we can turn them on and off remotely via MQTT commands. And the consequence of uh, this prevalence of MQTT around the place is that, uh, Devices that sort of control other devices like your Alexa or your home assistant uh, will also speak MQTT generally uh, because so many things use it. And that's another uh, useful interface. And so, you know, if, you, if you've if you now talk in the same language that's flying around between the devices and the uh, control systems and into your game, you know, you, you've, you, you might get somewhere. So, um, final little point I wanted to make is <clears throat> uh, that my background was actually uh, machine tool software. And so I worked in CAD CAM for quite a few years and then eventually worked in uh, Autodesk for a couple of years until I couldn't take it any longer. Um, but uh, lately, there's been a lot of technology moving on. And the, I mean, you'll be aware of the the, the amazing uh, growth in VR equipment or the quality of it. And then on the wave of this is we're going to get a whole bunch of really good augmented reality kit afterwards. Um, as far as I'm concerned, none of this actually has a, a killer app in it. You know, if there's games, but it's not like, uh, you know, uh, the, the Apple II got its... Uh, um, spreadsheet application which or or the mac got its desktop publishing where you had an application for which you had to buy the equipment to to do this application it was a, a fundamental game changer we don't have this really in this kit but um my view is that if and when such a a, a killer app is invented for this hardware games engines will probably be the only software that will implement this killer app all right, so sort of in the real world, in the engineering world, you've got uh, vast control panels uh, or control systems sometimes. I mean, I find find these uh, quite troublesome areas because <clears throat> uh, a lot of these panels, they've, they're historical relics because they've had to run wires from uh, various parts of an airplane or a power station all the way to this control panel. And there's physical wires and switches and lights. And then once everything's like going via networks and so forth, you no longer need to have this layout which has some uh, relationship with the uh, original device. So um, who knows? There might be a an application in VR involving controlling very large, complicated systems that don't involve working with these control panels or making a, a, an analog of these control panels. Um, another thing uh, that you find also is uh, BIM. That's another very popular area in, in industry, which is a lot of hype, but doesn't seem to <clears throat> have much application as far or, or, or real killer app and use in it. And this is where you put 
a, a building or a skyscraper and you have vast numbers of sensors in it to tell you what's happening to the building, I've, I've watched quite a lot of presentations on it and they, they never actually come up with anything useful with it, but we can do it. We can, we can install it. And then often the, the, or you're trying to do it with factories or uh, refineries, and there's probably a good <clears throat> use for IoT and BIM and stuff uh, to that. But what I've no normally noticed is that you'll get some beautiful pictures on the brochures, and then when you get to the actual software itself, the graphics is terrible. All right? Um, you know, uh, they sort of look like, uh, look like 1983. Uh, and I, my view, uh, having been in this sort of world of, of engineering software, is that it's not because, uh, uh, you know, there's a good reason for it. It's just because the engineers are amateurs at computer graphics. We just can't do it very well. And and uh, if you push a little bit further, you often find that the there's a bit of sour grapes in it. You know, oh, of course, we don't waste our time making pretty graphics because we're just doing a serious uh, system. You know, well, if that was true, then why aren't the graphics like this on the brochure? You know, if it was serious, if that's what people actually wanted. So I, I think that's sort of where this opportunity comes from. So in my view, there's this future productivity in, in the way, uh, you know, a games engine might be able to take over the world. Because on our side, on the games engine, you've got uh, some pretty nifty artwork, uh, which you're not going to get in engineering. Um, and maybe, and then you've got a pretty good 3D rendering, rendering and animation of uh, pretty amazing characters. Uh, we've been developing user interfaces in games, so they actually have to be fun as opposed to perform a job. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that, that might be a good thing. Uh, we've also got real-time multiplayer networking where the uh, players are actually fighting against each other. So we have to have a, a quite a lot higher performance on that networking than on normal collaboration. And also uh, we've got uh, software that's targeting the modern uh, augmented reality and virtual reality devices, uh, which uh, the, the um, industrial software isn't. So on the, on the industrial software, you've got remote sensing and controlling, you know, like those big plants and machineries. Often there's some numerical calculations that are reasonably trivial when you can actually get down to them, but usually they're hidden away under so many layers of unverified stuff and just convention. So there will be, there are some very bad software and engineering that people just rely on because they know if they build a bridge or a concrete beam using the calculations for this, it won't go wrong. But they don't really push any further than that. Then there's also the whole CAD CAM business, which is the uh, computer aided design and, and M stands for manufacturer. So it's running uh, drill bits and so forth. And, um, you know, uh, that's what 3D printers are is a sort of a simpler version of CAM. And um, how do we uh, sort of, the way that the two sort of systems of software is uh, on the game side, we've got a mass market and low prices and it's always up to date with the hardware. Over on the on the uh, on the industrial software, it's very low volume. There's really not very many people who are going to build, are going to design, or be paid to design a skyscraper, and the prices are extremely high as a consequence. And most of the software was designed for obsolete hardware, which means, I, I mean, I know my uh, I know from CAD quite well is that the CAD software was mostly designed in the 1980s and 1990s, and basically has been debugged since then. And a computer in 1990 was uh, had about two CPUs and a couple of hundred uh, mega, megabytes of RAM, and that was it. So, uh, oh, and there was no GPU. So the, uh, the software still runs on that stuff. Well, it still runs on the modern stuff, but it was written for that stuff. And so as far as I'm concerned, it's really, really obsolete. Um, and the talk I've just done was sort of showing off uh, this little part of it, which we could easily put into Godot just with a couple of scripts like this, uh, particularly if we find some applications and uh, hopefully take over the rest of it. So and with that, that's my end, end of my talk and uh, uh, ready for a Q&A.